Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome back. Um, that was an amazing video. What an amazing way to get to know somebody, but through their daughter. Um, so next up, we have our live experience panel discussion. So just a reminder that you are welcome to type in questions in the Q&A box. If you're having some tech difficulties with the Q&A box, then the chat function is, is there for you as well. So I'm gonna be your MC. My name is Georgina. Hi, everyone. Um, so how we're gonna do this is that we are going to first start off with some, some sharing. I'm gonna introduce everybody with their bios one by one, and they're gonna have up to five minutes to share a little bit of their experiences with homelessness. So I'm gonna be monitoring that. So if you go over five minutes, I'm gonna give you two cues. So I'll go like this visually. You all can see that and also kind of cut in verbally as well. I know five minutes is uh, not a lot, but then we have a facilitated discussion as a second part of the panel as well. Okay. Um, so our first panelist to speak will be Heather. Heather, can I see you visually just to make sure you're there? Great, wonderful. So I'm going to read your bio here and I'm going to throw it over to you for a few minutes. So Heather Majori has been working with SDCWR, Supporting a Better Tent City, to documenting progress of the project and is a Zoom host MC of this amazing event. Her passion is working with groups experiencing marginalization and using applied theater techniques to help animate their experiences for the purposes of empowerment, analysis, research and planning for positive social change and community transformation while working toward a more equitable and just society. For coming to work with SDC, she coordinated a community arts project addressing the truth and reconciliation called action number 94. She has herself experienced the spectrum of housing insecurity, from living for a short time in a shelter for women experiencing domestic violence after leaving a difficult relationship. She has been forced to live in housing that was condemned and unsafe, both before and after becoming a single mother. And she became homeless after giving birth to her daughter in 1996 when Premier Harris came to power and created a scapegoat campaign against single mothers accessing family benefits. She is the proud mother of a now 25 year old adult daughter who made it. She is Algonquin Abinishabukwe, who is considered a non status Indian under Canadian law. She is a wife, a daughter, a granddaughter, an aunt, a friend, actor, director playwright, spoken word artist, and singer-songwriter. Thank you, Heather. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I've got five minutes to kind of just share what I can with you. Um, first of all, I just, I, I truly and honestly believe that everybody is an, is an expert of their own life and their own experience. And if we just spend a little bit of time listening, maybe we'll do things a little differently. Um, so just to let you know, so the first time I, I experienced housing precarity, I was um, in, uh, well, actually, I mean, uh, we grew up in, in, in circumstances where um, we had a home, uh, but it was, um, you could kick off, we had, we had these chimneys that you, you didn't have any, um, you didn't have any mortar in the, uh, in, in the bricks, so you could kick off the, the chimney bricks. So it was it was a it was a makeshift home, but it was not bad. It was a log house, so it also had some pretty awesome uh, qualities about it. Uh, and our our cupboards were made out of orange crates, which was kind of uh, great. So when I went to university, I was a first generation to go to university, and I did end up at one point at the last year in a condemned house where the rats were so bad that um, the uh, they had to come and poison them, which means when rats are that bad in a house, they actually rot in the wind, in the walls. So I used to go to school smelling like dead rat. Um, but, uh, and, and the thing about that was interesting. It was a bylaw issue, which was, there was a loophole that said you couldn't kick somebody out of a house, right? Because they're a tenant. Uh, in a condemned, uh, if you couldn't condemn the house, if somebody was living in it. So the, so the slumlord uh, spent his time making sure he always had someone in that house because you couldn't stay there longer than a few months. And then you were, you were, you know, pretty much homeless again. So, um, and yeah, my, I had mushrooms growing out of my, my, uh, 
floor in the bathroom. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget the mushrooms up <laughs> in the floor. It was like, oh, okay. I'm used to that camping. I'm not used to that in my house. Um, but, uh, and then uh, I was in a relationship that was uh, abusive when I was in my early 20s. And so I ended up um, at a uh, women's shelter, which was a really good experience for me because it was prior to Harris. And so there, was, there were more resources. And I really needed the structure and I found the structure useful and I found the, the company of women very helpful. And I found a lot of the social workers to be amazing and helpful. And uh, about three months later, I was able to, uh, to leave there, but I had, I had housing precarity pretty much the entire time until I had my daughter. And so precarity for me was, you know, two months here, three months there, a bedroom at somebody's house, a couch somewhere else, moving to Toronto, um, having like four months as a, a um, sublet, things like that. Um, when I got my, when I, when I, when I got pregnant, it was the first time I ever used a food bank and I used the food bank down in Toronto, uh, the daily food bank. And it was probably the best experience of a food bank I've ever had, because at least you could shop for what you wanted. And that allowed you to at least go around and pick and choose. So you didn't have to take stuff you didn't want. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we could just have that respect for each other? to go, you know, I, I just can't eat that, I'm allergic to it, or, or whatever that was. Um, I had other experiences later where people would just dump food. And I love food, but it, 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 was, it was hurtful. And I remember one time I went to a church, and this is, I, I had precarious housing again, and I said I needed a, a couch, and, but they couldn't accommodate me. So they came by and dropped me off food. And I was like, I'm okay, I got food right now, but I need couch. <laughs> and so there was always that kind of miscommunication or that not listening uh, part of it that really shocked me and surprised me actually. So now that I'm older, I, I really think that the key to social change is actually just listening. And I think I got a minute left. Anyway, when I had my daughter, it was when uh, Harris came into power and it was 1996, so I will never forget it. I gave birth to my daughter. I became homeless five weeks later. I had to go to social services in the middle of a snowstorm to prove that I had had her, which seemed utterly ridiculous to me. It was just an indignity. It was, um, it was demeaning and it was completely contrary to the actual experience I'd had, which was obviously my body gave birth to a child. And um, so we became homeless. I was lucky. I had friends that let me stay at their house until I could find a place. Then I became a landlord where I collected rent and I paid the, the most. You're not going to believe this. This is 20, 20, yeah, like 25 years ago now. And my, my rental or uh, allowance was $550. And that was as a mother and child. And I don't think it's changed much. And I couldn't find a place then. I had to leave Toronto and I had to go to Windsor. And uh, the only way I was able to make it work was I became the rent collector. And so I could, they were deducting my rent essentially. Unfortunately, uh, there was a lot of serious violence. And so everything in my house was stolen. And uh, so you can imagine that after a while, there's a lot of trauma that occurs and it's, it's layered and it's, uh, it, it actually grinds you right down. And uh, my daughter has post-traumatic stress as well. Uh, sometimes she can't name it. Um, she's fine, she's awesome, she's alive and she's 25 years old. So I say, yay, we won and we Great. did. There you go. I'm going to stop you there, okay? But thank. You. I know. I know. There's more to say. But we'll come back to you and facilitate a conversation. I limited so, it to five because I know how much I can talk. So next we have Nadine. Nadine, can I see you visually? Just to make sure you're there and ready to go, please. If you are there, there you are. Hi. Okay. So I'm going to read some words for you, okay, and introduce you. Then I'll give you five minutes. 
Uh, Nadine Green is the on-site coordinator for Better Tent City at Lot 42. She was a variety store owner in downtown Kitchener who transformed her store into a makeshift shelter for people who were being forced to sleep rough on the streets and who had nowhere to go. As a result of being evicted from her store on Water Street, she met Ron Doyle and Jeff Wilmer. As it turned out, they were working on a project to develop tiny homes to help address the ever-growing homeless situation in the region of Waterloo. Through their conversations after her eviction, when COVID hit, Ron offered his property at 41 Arldo Place as a haven for the homeless, if Nadine agreed to live on site and coordinate the project. She lives in her own tiny house at Lot 42 and she loves it, but her sleep can be short because after her eviction, she took her store on the road for homeless friends in the region and those now who have housing but are struggling to afford rent and food at the same time. A graduate of Galt Collegiate Institute in Cambridge, having moved to this region from Jamaica in 1984, her favorite song of course is One Love by Bob Marley. Not only does she like the song, she lives it every day through several acts of compassion regularly and she couldn't be happier. So thank you, Nadine, I'll throw it over to you and I'll give you five minutes. I think she went away. Oh, you went away, it was something I said. <laughs> okay. Oh, that could be the doorbell. I don't know if the attendees can hear the doorbell, but every time somebody comes into our panelists round here, we get the doorbell. Well, maybe maybe we can um, we can put, hold on. Yeah, yeah, let's get let's let's you know, Kelly, Kelly, you're next up there. Um, are you ready to go, Kelly? We can go to you and then come back to Nadine a little later. Hmm. Where are people? There you are. There's Kelly. Okay, then. So if you're good to go, I'll introduce you if that's okay. Great. So Kelly Welch. Misqua Megazenque, Red Eagle Woman, is an Ishnabukwe Crane Clan from Flying Post First Nation. Born in Kitchener, she has lived in Waterloo Region her whole life. In 2016, she experienced homelessness. Her healing journey has connected her to her culture and teaching, which has had a profound impact. She is happy, grateful, and honored to share these things with you. Thank you, Kelly. Hello. Um, so I had uh, done an introduction this morning, but I, I'm just going to do it again because it's just, it helps me when I speak to kind of remember who I am. When I'm introducing myself, as I'm announcing to creation and to everyone, and I'm remembering who I am right now. So, Ani, Musqua Megazikwe, and Dishnakos, Dijak and Dodem, Flying Post and Donchpa, and Nishnabe and Dao. And so, I had said my uh, spirit name is Red Eagle Woman. I'm Crane Clan from Flying Post, which is a small uh, reserve in Treaty 9 territory. Uh, I was born in Waterloo Region, though, and I've lived here my whole life. Uh, I'm a Nishnabe Ojibwe, and I have some other mixed ancestry as well. Um, in sharing uh, my story, you know, there, there's Lots of parts I can think of, and, and uh, you know, there's a, a big journey there. But in after hearing today, I, something I just wanted to share was um, the people I've met. Um, you know, I, I can share a lot of stories about a lot of trauma and a lot of things that went wrong and a lot of barriers I came up against and a lot of experiences that, you know, were not pleasant. But I'm also sitting here, you know, five years later in my own apartment, living a good life, doing good things. And that's because of the kindness and generosity of people. And this is from people you would least expect. Uh, when I was homeless, I had no contact with anybody from my previous life, I guess, if you want to say I had gotten into addiction and was incarcerated and came out. So at that time, you know, no one from that life was in my life. Um, and I relied on charity of other people to uh, house me, feed me, clothe me, care for me. And it's people who didn't know me, people who didn't have extra to share. They open up their home. They would give me the last can of vegetables in their cupboard when I knew people in my life that had excess and said, I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve a chance, right? Because I had ruined too many. 
So I want to acknowledge and say thank you to the people who said I still deserved a chance, you know. Um, I watched a bit of the lunch preparation going on and to hear the conversations and to see those things. That, and it, that's what it reminds me, that community is that family. And I still have, even though I'm housing all these things, I, I have family that is not because they are my family. Um, I can walk down the street and I will take a package of cigarettes and I will give it to a homeless person. The first pr thing I will see them do is grab that pack and call their friends over and say, hey, and they'll start passing them around. They'll start sharing them. They take care of each other. So, you know, I, I've, I've heard things about security. I've heard things about this and, you know, about those structures and expectations we put on each other. You know, sometimes it's just like, let's, let, let them live and let, let people take care of each other because they'll do a much better job. Uh, that's where I got lifted up. That's the care I got. You know, that's where I started, you know, they're the ones who told me you matter. You know, don't listen to those other people because they knew what it felt like to be told you're no good. You, you know, those, the looks you get that you're just not worth being human. So, uh. I don't know how much time I'm at, but okay, um, you have a few more minutes. Okay, uh, I get passionate um, because it changed my life, right? That can be what you can explain as I will say it was an awakening for myself because I had everything. I had everything you should have in life: a big home, a nice job, the kids, the cars, the husband, all those things, and they didn't make me happy. And when they did end up, you know, when I lost all of those things, living, all of a sudden it was basic needs. All of a sudden I was just really grateful to have a roof over my head, you know, even like I was thinking, I'm thinking about, you know, I'll hear there's security and this and that. And sometimes I'm like, you know what, sometimes you'll take a night anywhere that's a little bit safe and comfortable and better in the open. It's better in the elements. It's better if you have a couple people. You got a friend that's gonna watch your back. You know you have. You know that that community means a lot. So uh, don't don't discredit it. And you know Nadine. I used to go to her store. You know when I would walk the streets at night, she was a safe place. And one of my favorite memories is that she would when it, you know she'd have apples because I love apples and that's something I didn't have access to easily was fresh fruits. And I could go to her store and even though I never had money, I could get an apple. So I just want to say, you know, and that is one of the kindnesses, right? Thank you, so, Kelly. Thank you. thank you, I'm gonna stop you there, but thank you for that. Thank you for, for being vulnerable with us like that. Um, so, and we'll come back to you as well for the facilitation. So I'm going to try Nadine again. Nadine, are you, we lost you before. Are you there? There you are. That's what yes, I Yes, I'm here. All right. So I'm going to. I was actually walking to my house and my phone died. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm glad to see you. We were worried about you for a second. Okay. So I'm going to read some words here. Actually, I already, already uh, so I actually already read the words that you shared with us. So I'll um, I didn't even get to hear the bio because my phone died. Oh, oh, oh no, I'm going to say this again then. Great. I can talk yeah, about you again. You. Okay. Nadine Green is the on-site coordinator for Better Tent City at Lot 42. She was a variety store owner in downtown Kitchener who transformed her store into a makeshift shelter for people who were being forced to sleep rough on the streets and who had nowhere to go. As a result of being evicted from her store on Water Street, she met Ron Doyle and Jeff Wilmer. As it turned out, they were working on a project to develop tiny homes to help address the ever-going homeless situation in the region of Waterloo. Through their conversations after her eviction, then COVID hit, Ron offered his property at 41 Arlda Place as a haven for the homeless if Nadine agreed to live on site and coordinate the project. She lives in her own tiny house, as we can see, on lot 42 and she loves it, but her sleep can be short because after her eviction, she took her store on the road for her homeless friends in the region and those who now have housing but are struggling to afford rent and food at the same time. A graduate of Galt Collegiate Institute in Cambridge, 
Having moved to this region from Jamaica in 1984, my favorite song, of course, is One Love by Bob Marley. Not only does she live this song, she, <laughs> she loves the song, she lives it every day through several acts of compassion regularly, and she couldn't be happier. So I'll throw it to you for five minutes. Thank you. What would you like me to say? <laughs> so we're hoping to give you share a little bit of your experiences with homelessness, whatever you kind of feel moved to share, especially after today. Well, actually, I can share a little like I, I became homeless when I was um, 18 years old. I got kicked out of my parents' place and I was sleeping in hallways. I, I was still actually going to high school. Nobody knew that I was homeless. I would still go to school, have a, have a smile. I was on the soccer team. I played sports, so nobody knew I was. I would get to school at 6 a.m. and probably catch up on some sleep, have a shower, and just go about my day. And back to when I had my store. So when I had to move into my store, after I started having people um, sleeping in my store, sorry, I actually moved into my store into a little cubby hole mm. and um, 30, 40 people would sleep in each night. And then I met Ron Doyle. I mentioned that before. And he came in and he thought it was magical. He thought it was amazing. And we strike up a friendship. And that's when the plan started forming together about a better 10 city. After COVID hit, people had no place to go. So Ron came and asked if I would like to move into his um, 41 hour dealt, his business venue and um, run a, a, tent, a tent city. And I said, sure, anything to help the homeless. I, I didn't have the chance to help out a lot because my store was closed. So even when I moved into the lot, I would still go out at night and deliver meals to people who were living on the street. So I was running the lot and I was still doing the night job, going out, delivering meals, saying hello to people, giving them a smile, making sure they're all right. I would give hugs and smile. Even when COVID was around and they were like, stay away from people, keep your distance. I still hug because I know in those times, the time when the COVID came in, it was harder for the homeless because people were staying away from them in the beginning. And then when COVID hit, it was like, stay away from the homeless. They're the ones that have COVID. I, I still would go around hugging, smiling, just giving love, giving compassion. And I think that helped with people's mental health. I don't know what else to say. That's great. I also like how you shared a little bit about your experience as a teenager. Because that's that's something that we haven't heard from today yet. Some experience yeah. as a teenager with homelessness. Yeah, I was homeless and nobody knew. Even now when I um, have conversation with some of my friends from high school, they're like, I didn't know you were homeless. I said, I didn't tell anybody because I was embarrassed. Because when you become homeless, you, you feel embarrassed. It's just a feeling that you have. And you just don't tell people because you're thinking... I don't know if I'm going to be allowed over at their house because if people think you're homeless, they don't want to invite you over in case you're staying and you're not leaving because you have nowhere to go. So I just put on a smile. I did my thing and I never said anything to anybody. I, I just kept that as my own little secret yeah. and still carried on. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And we'll come back to you with the, the facilitated conversation as well. Thank you for that. Okay, so just making, so making sure we have no questions, no questions yet. Just a reminder that you're welcome to type those into the Q&A box if you have anything that you, you wanna ask our panelists. Um, so our next lived experience panelist is Alvin O'Day. Alvin, can I see your face if you're there, please? Making sure that you're ready to go. Not there. Okay, that's great. We'll move on to, to somebody else. Hopefully Alvin will be able to join us soon. So next then we'll go to Shar. Shar, you're ready to go. Thank you. You read my mind. I was gonna ask you if, it, if I could see your face. Okay, so I'll read your bio. I'll give you a few minutes then to kind of talk a little bit about your own experience with homelessness as well. 
Charlene Lee was Charlene Diane Lee was born on April the 9th, 1981 at KW Hospital, what is now known as Grand River Hospital. She is part of the PAG Peer Action Group, the Unsheltered Campaign, and she works for the WINS program at the CTS. Her passions are working with and supporting the homeless in whatever way she can. Having been there herself, she understands what they are going through each day. In 2010, her world was turned upside down now that both her parents had passed away and she had just given birth when she walked into what was then Mary's place because she had nowhere to live. Her other passions are her love of Lego, where she's developing a community planning and visioning project using her favorite building blocks. She loves to spend time with her friends and family, including her same sex partner. Her favorite beverage is coffee. In her own words, I love, love, love coffee. Yeah. Hopefully, that, hopefully I said that right with the kind of meaning you would have to it. <laughs> Need we say more? Up ahead, we have Shark. So Heather, you spin that around pretty good, eh? <laughs> um, yeah, I lived at Mary's place. Um, it was probably the hardest time of my life, but also the best time of my life. Um Oh, okay. <laughs> I got ripped apart living there, like piece by piece, slowly. Um, very suicidal, very emotional, didn't know where to turn, didn't know who to talk to. Um, but ten years later, like today, ten years ten years ago, that was ten years ago. And I'll tell you, like, go back to some of the stuff Kelly was saying, I still have friends from Mary's Place that will probably will be my friends until I die, right? Like, you, you do, you meet people that you would never expect to talk to you, you would never expect to, like, share your story with, or I didn't know anything about the homeless homeless population when I went to marriage place. Um, I knew I knew what drugs were, and I, I was involved with that before I was ever homeless, but it wasn't because of, like, my parents or anything that I was – using drugs, I actually started using drugs on accident. Um, I went to a party one night and I had a headache. And I asked my friend if they had any Tylenol. Well, they had Tylenol, but they also had ecstasy in their backpack. So I accidentally took two ecstasy pills instead of taking two Tylenol. So that was how my journey of drugs started. Um, Heather, ask me a question. <laughs> Heather. <laughs> I'm coming. Uh, I think actually that was actually pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> it was five minutes roughly because people are going to start asking questions for the next like hour. So right, cool. we get to leave them hanging and give them something interesting to, to latch on to. Does that work for you, Georgina? Yeah, you can use up to five minutes, whatever you want to share to begin with. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Already that, that was a lot. I kind of want to know more. So thank this you for that. Powerful, powerful panel. Um, so I want to make sure that we haven't missed Alvin here. It looks like they're not here. I just wanted to say sometimes that's going to happen or it will happen. We agreed to that, that if they need to deal with something that they okay. would go and then they'll show up again. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that maybe that they hadn't messaged somebody and saying they're on their way, yeah. but okay. Okay. Then, so then in that case, then we'll move on to um, Alex and the facilitated conversation. Alexandra, are you there? There you are. Wonderful. So I'm going to read your bio as well. This is fun. I like I like reading people's bios. <laughs> All right. Alexandra Petrovic always knew she would live in different parts of the world. After being left by Yugoslavia to reside in Serbia, to Sweden, to Cyprus, to Quebec, and now here in Ontario. This may be the end of her travels. For sure, not the end of her learning journey. She wanted to be a teacher because this is the way that you learn the best. And she was one of the first few years of professional life until the spin happened into adult education and social justice work during the Civil War to help promote women's political and economic rights, peaceful conflict resolution, and civic engagement in the most marginalized areas of the country. Upon immigrating to Canada, and the first time her family faced homelessness as newcomers, a new set of challenges presented themselves, such as anti-racism in school and governance systems, immigration-related economic and settlement policies, class divisions in cities and lack of enforcement of tenants' rights, as well as new aspirations to democratic renewal, elimination of poverty, and equity-based system change. She is dedicated to learning from all voices of lived experience 
into bridging through negotiation of different worlds and worldviews we find ourselves locked in. But we are not locked in, are we? Currently, community-based solutions to the housing crisis are front and center of our research and community development work as the Executive Director of the Social Development Center, Waterloo Region. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you, everyone. Um, every story is different. And um, there are those stories when you don't even know you're homeless, right? It was definitely my case. Um, you know, a welcoming landlord almost, you know, meets you at the airport when you land as, as an immigrant, right? And invites you um, into this new country. And um, only down the road, you realize that it was a predatory practice by so many and uh, far too many that there should be, right? And when your conditions become unlivable, you don't even think, right? Is there a label? Does it have a name? You just do what you have to do to protect your family and yourself. And um, it is, it is hard awakening in, in the new country that um, adheres to right in, in its promotion to the outside world um, as just and um, there are rules to be followed you find that there aren't many um, supports for tenants uh, particularly newcomers immigrants refugees when they are um, in private rental housing and um, regardless I uh, was already an advocate and an activist, and there was nothing really, not much you could you could do. Um, and some of you were saying, "What were your landing places?" Well, um, in my case, it was um, another family uh, from Iran that we met, and uh, we spent time in their home until situation resolved. But. Um, only much later, I learned the label, right? And uh, what that traumatic experience is called. So I guess that story, that, that life experience did influence uh, in a great extent uh, what my path would be, both in Montreal and um, here in Ontario worked both in London and uh, here in the region. So as we move into um, questions, answers, comments, they're all welcome. Um, I would like to ask others who shared part of their experience and part of their story. When did they feel heard, right? Either during or after their experience from homelessness, when do they feel that their story made a difference? Shar? Um, you, you, so, sometimes you don't, you don't feel hurt. Sometimes you don't feel hurt. The, you go to different meetings and stuff, and VT Council has come to a lot of meetings, well, you know, it was alive and, and PAG and stuff, and they say, oh, I'm going to, we're gonna give you back the report when we're done making it and you never see it. So they, they always say they want lived experience, but they never continue with it ever. So you don't feel, you, you, you could talk the same story, you could tell your story a thousand times and you don't feel heard. You do feel heard when it's like us guys talking, like, like Heather or like, you, Alex, and, and like stuff, right? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't really know the other people. Or Nadine knows what I'm talking about, but like, like that. It, and when you're talking to like the people that work in this industry or like with our groups and stuff, then you feel heard. But other than that, no, you don't feel heard. Yeah. Thank you, Shar, for uh, sharing your experience again with this. Anybody else? I can speak to that. Um, uh, the first time I felt heard that it made a difference was when Heather, you know, pulled me into a room with 
some of the some of the people that are here and and um I was very emotional that day. I was crying. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I didn't, you know, I'd seen so much of the negative. I didn't believe that there was people out there. I didn't believe there was advocates. I didn't believe there was people, you know, pounding on those doors. And then here was a room full of them. And then they were saying, we're going to do something. And they're saying, you know, and then Ron, you know, this just, we're just going to do it. Just do it. Just do it. And he was in a position to be able to do that. You know, so people who are in positions to be able to do that, because so many of us are not, he used that, you know, so bless, like, bless them. Thank you for using your position. But anyways, I, I'm like, I'm going a little off topic and, and, um, but, you know, I heard, I felt heard there. Um, and. I'm starting to feel heard more, you know, as I'm sharing my story more, I, I feel more heard. So I just want to say thank you for the opportunity, because, you know, I am emotional today, but part of that is part of that healing. Um, so, yeah, uh, I like seeing things that, you know, it's very discouraging when you, when you do share your experience, and then there's, you know, it's kind of the same old again, right? So this is, this is the space where I've seen suggestions that I've you know, from experience, and, and they've been used, and then, you know, further phone calls, like even, you know, in the beginning, and what do you think, Kelly, and what about this and that, and, and so, I yeah, I appreciate all of that, thank you to this group here. Heather, you would uh, have to unmute, yes, thanks. <laughs> I've tried to organize this. I still don't know how the whole thing works, but it all it all works out. Um, I feel heard through everybody else for the most part, and I'm thrilled that I met people that were just like me, but not entirely. Um, I think I've spent my life always knowing I was a little odd and uh, I didn't fit. And um, and I was so filled with shame and anger especially, especially like I have, my story is not the same as Char's, but it's similar in that I was, I got pregnant and, uh, and that's how I ended up homeless. And I'm like, hot damn, who knew, right? How, how unvalued, uh, how unvalued you, you became. The worst part was being the virgin and the whore. And I'm going to talk plainly because as a single mother in this society, and I know people want to think that it doesn't happen that way, but it does. As long as I had a baby, I was the virgin mother. So people would send me stuff, <laughs> right? And oh, you poor dear. And you know, and, and it's for the child. It's not for you. That's the other thing. It's not for you. It's for the child. And, um, and then as the child grows, if you haven't figured it out yet, then you're the whore. And you were probably the whore before, right? Because you, uh, well, you're a single mother. So, um, and for me, that really damaged me. It was when Harris came into power and he was doing the, his big, big campaign. He had an ad campaign and his scapegoat population was single moms. So I, <laughs> I was there during when he came into power and uh because we were all going to drink too much beer was the problem um and so that's how they could justify cutting back the 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 uh family allowance because you couldn't trust single mothers because they drink too much beer and god knows what they'll spend it on and that uh so i never felt heard I can honestly tell you it's only later that I felt heard. And I think that's why I care about doing advocacy because I never felt heard. I had to yell. I had to yell so hard that I um, <laughs> got censored. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> yes, it does happen in Canada, trust me. Um, so uh, yeah. So I, I, I feel heard now. I feel heard because of the Social Development Center, to be honest. I feel heard because I have friends. Uh, some of them are on this panel today. 
Um, some of them I've shared major experiences with and they understand. So that's what's awesome. Uh, there is a hand up, so I'm going to be going to wear costumes for you. <laughs> yes, sure. This is a tough day. Thank you. Um, Nadine, you did tell us, and I see that Tara has uh, her hand up. Nadine, I, definitely you told us about being heard when meeting Ron. Um, do you want to add another instance or something about being yeah. heard? I will um, say something because Alvin is having a bit of a gun shy. I just went to his house, banged on his door. I'm like, Alvin, you're up. And he's like, Maddie, I'm gun shy. <laughs> it's okay. So I said, okay. And I just said, okay. I didn't pressure him because I know he was ready this morning and um, he's feeling gun shy. So maybe I can speak a little bit for him. Yeah. Just tell him, just but, tell him that we love him. But the one thing I wanted to add was when I got kicked out of my store, it was mass homelessness because now there was 30 people who had no place to sleep. And I remember we all went to this guy's house. His name is Kyle. And he took us all in, me, Joseph, Alvin, Kimberly, Jessica. There was about 10 of us that was working in the store because it was a big operation. We had like, I was running the store. I had a help from Alvin. As I said, Joseph was working at the store and I just hired people from the street. If you were not from the street, you couldn't work at the store because by that time it was just homeless people and nobody would understand us. So you had to be from the street. And I remember when the store was closed, I was so stressed. It was my first time getting depressed. I didn't know what depression was all about. And we all went to Kyle's house and I slept for 24 hours. And I felt like I was slipping in a black hole, like a black hole. It was all darkness. And I got up and I said, screw this. And I remember I went to the soup kitchen because nobody wanted me around. I had no friends at this point, except for people on the street. And I went to the soup kitchen and I got a stand innovation from the workers and the people there. And I was so happy and not to be praised, but just knowing that, oh my God. And the guys were coming up, Nadine, thank you for sacrificing your store. Thank you for all that you've done for us. You care about us. And I felt good. And I sat there all day because I had nowhere to go. Because as I said, nobody wanted me around. And then after that, I went to the Ray of Hope because I did the journey. I went to the Ray of Hope and I had dinner and I hung out. And the next day, again, I went back to Kyle's house and the next day I did the same thing. Went to the soup kitchen, went to the Ray of Hope. And then after that, I started making meals, cooking and bringing it out. And that's how going mobile came about just making the meals. And then I was keeping in touch with Ron. I didn't want to ask Ron for anything. I know if I asked him for something, he would be there. Because I remember the one time when they wouldn't take the rent money from the store because I called my landlord and I said, you know, I want the rent, like I have the money for the rent. Marianne is her name. I'll call names now. And I said, Marianne, she's like, we don't want your rent money. We want you gone. So if you don't take, if she didn't take the rent money at that time, the money is spent because there are so much people coming. I have to buy chocolate milk. It was chocolate milks and donuts and apples. That's what Kelly said. I always had apples. So we, like we had the free side at the store. I, I had apples and donuts, like something sweet. Cause if you have drug addiction, you need something sweet. If you don't have money, then the sweetness, the, the sugar will help you. And, you know, like I remember I just was just, and the one time I was behind my rent by 2,800 and one of the guys emailed Ron, I'm like, please don't do that. And Ron came, he walked in, I was so embarrassed. And he's like, how much do you owe? I'm like, please Ron. And he's like, how much do you owe? And I said the word, cause $2,800 to me is a lot of money. And I said, 2,800. <laughs> and he flicked out his checkbook. He wrote 2800 he says, pay them. I'm like, thank you, Ron, so much. I said, I promise I'll pay you back. I didn't know how I would because I didn't have any means. And I remember, oh, sorry, turn off my phone. And I remember I paid the rent. And then when he asked me about the 10 city, I said yes, because I wanted to. And yes, also, because I also wanted to pay him back his $2,800.
which I owed him. But just, sorry, my phone is ringing. I'm trying to. And just, you know, and then back to Alvin again. So Alvin became homeless because he was helping a lot of people living in his house. He had an apartment and he let, I guess, 15, 20 people in and he got kicked out. So he used to come to the store and shop. And then he came in the one night and he was sad and I offered him a patty and a drink. And I'm like, can I offer you a patty and a chocolate milk? He's like, thank you. And he came down, came in and he sat down and then he said, he, he told me his story. He got kicked out. I said, you want to stay here? Sure. And I set up a spot for him and that was it. He moved in and then he started working and living at the store. New corner store, the, the, it was just amazing. And then he, you know, Ron would come in and we never asked Ron for anything. Like we, we didn't want to. If we asked him for something, he would give it to us, but we just didn't want to ask him for anything. He would say, do you guys need anything? And we're like, no, like we're good. And just, I don't know, ask me a question. I don't know. So I do have a yes, question. Yes, there will be a question. Just uh, to um, acknowledge that Tara had her hand and it's a really good uh, example model for our special contributors as well today. Um, as um, we said this morning that we will have, uh, uh, some of the guests who will be able to raise their hand and uh, open their video and their microphone and join the conversation as we move further um, based on what we heard so far. I guess the question for all of us is, well, how can we best include voices of lived experience of homelessness in designing solutions moving forward, but that's just me. And I would uh, uh, do, um, I would uh, present some of the people we have with us who ha are working hard to make sure that solutions are there. Um, Lynn Short from K Kitchener Waterloo Community Foundation. Um, and uh, we thanked her already today for um, agreeing to accept a very unusual report on a grant we received through the foundation from Canadian government, right, Community Emergency uh, Support Fund. There um, we have Ryan Petitpierre, who is director of uh, housing services in the region, and uh, him, his staff are in many places and working on a number of projects moving forward to the 10 year plan. And we do have uh, people from city of Kitchener, Debbie Chapman, counselor, and uh, I think Andrew Ramsroop is with us as well, the lead for the housing strategy of the city of Kitchener. City of Waterloo, uh, Jan Vasic, I think is here with us and uh, Brian Doucette joined um, Canada Chair for um, uh, Urban Planning and Social Inclusion with University of Waterloo. So do follow Ter's uh, example. It is a comment. It is an insight. It is a question you may have for panelists. We will uh, first start with Ter, and she's a cultural worker and activist in our community. Um, many affiliations, right? And then Georgina, we will be back to you with uh, questions from uh, Q&A from attendees. So. I hope this works. Hello, Ter. Hi, how are you doing? Well, good. Um, so we were talking about um, um, being heard. And uh, I, I really wanted to underscore something that Kelly said in her, um, her talking about her experience, that she absolutely felt heard by other homeless people, other people who are in circumstances of poverty or housing or food insecurity, that that is where you find the greatest amount of, of that beginning of fellowship and having people understand your circumstance in compassionate ways. Um, going from that to feeling heard in other spaces as someone who's experienced um, housing insecurity and food insecurity as well as homelessness, um, it required to be out of those circumstances to be heard. So I was never heard when I was in them. 
when I came to another side where I, where I had some security, that's when the listening started to take place. And I think it's good that people are listened to after the fact, but also that doesn't speak to the contemporary issues that are going on with housing insecurity and harm reduction and all kinds of things that require immediate attention. So, you know, back when I was homeless, we organized a list of cheap food, open dumpsters, free places you could sleep, um, restaurants that would give you food, those sorts of things. Um, and we passed out these lists just as a part of building security for, for our friends who were also on the street. Um, and we were never listened to. <laughs> and it didn't matter where we were in that intersection of poverty, we were never listened to until we got to the other side. So that's maybe just something I wanted to add. Um, that, you know, like taking from Kelly's experience, because that was so poignant and powerful to, to, to feel that transition where it's like, wow, my voice means nothing there. The only thing I've changed is a situation in my life. And now my voice matters. <laughs> so anyway, that's all. Thank you, Thir. Any of the panelists? Shar, you are showing us something. Uh, and me, you know, let me ask you to uh, unmute there. Sorry, um, this is what she's talking about. It's like a list of food, food places and stuff. I don't know if you can see it. So it's where you can go to get food, different days of the week in Cambridge, Kitchener and Waterloo. Yeah, That's what she's talking sure. about. I'm like, we have one of those. <laughs> and, uh... Absolutely, number of agencies are contributing to updating um, lists such as that one, and uh, their copies are printed through um, Regional Waterloo and, and other services, and many of us do continue to, to print them, so truly useful. Anybody from the panel, any comments, or we can move to um, questions? Um, Georgina, what was, uh, Heather, you wanted to add? I was, I was just going to say that, uh, um, jumping off of what Tara was saying was um, because I worked in radio, it was community radio that whether I thought I was being heard or not was where um, when my daughter was really young, uh, we did a show called Poverty Line, which uh, helped us build some form of community because once we had, once I had housing, then I was just dealing with the other, all the other insecurities that come with, with having no money and some housing. Uh, so, um, so I think that those are really vital, vital activities actually in the communities are where we can help people um, get our voices amplified. But also the receivers have to be there, like people need to listen and, and not project their experiences onto people. Because I agree with Ter, like it's, I, I'm prayed for a moment when I would get through it so that I could at least be heard. That's all I had to say. Very strong experience of stigma. Um, Georgina, can you share the question uh, you uh, found? And then uh, Debbie, I see your um, hand up. We'll be back to you. We actually have two questions. Uh, the first one here, for those who mentioned they had children when they were homeless, what were some of the additional complications you faced and what supports did you need as a parent who was homeless? Oh, my. Start, Char. Okay, first of all, if you're at a shelter and you have a child, a normal, something normal, if you are a smoker, it's so small, but it will change everything. Um, if you live in like a normal apartment, well, not apartment, well, you can go on your bus. So like if you live in a townhouse, right? And you, you would go outside to have a smoke. You would bring your baby monitor with you, right? Well, at Mary's Place, you if you do that, you, you look upon, you're looked upon as like a really bad parent for leaving your kid on the second floor. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's like um, something that you would be able to do in your normal house, like in a townhouse or like a complex or something. Um, 
not apartment building, obviously you'd go on your balcony, but like you get frowned on for doing simple things like that. So something that you think you're, you know, benefiting your child from because you're not smoking around them, you you get looked down on. So even little things like um, if you asked if they were awake and you could ask somebody to watch them for a second so you'd have a minute break, they they you get tore apart for that too. So I think that there needs to be a little more leeway in the shelter system for that, for parents, single parents, like men and women, single parents, like I've seen it both ways at marriage place as well as the men's hostel. Like I've seen a lot of stuff go down there too. Um, but I don't think that single parents are given a chance at marriage place or at the Charles Street hostel. Yeah. Thank you, Char. It, it does, again, put a different label on people and what they can and cannot do, right? Depending where they live and how they live. Um, anybody else from the panel? I, um, I was fortunate in that uh, my children went with their father um, about two months before I had lost, you know, my life was on a downward spiral and, and you know, part of losing everything was losing my children. Um, and so that's something I was very grateful for, you know, in, in that they didn't have to it was, it was hard looking after myself. How the hell could I have looked after them? So anybody who's having to do that, and I just want to say, I'm just going to say this, and I know there's, you know, why are children in our shelters? Why are there children in shelters? That's, I you don't have the answer, right? But that just, I have to ask that question. Because sometimes it's the safest place for them to be. That's my answer. If there are no I mean, other options. Right. There in the whole world. Yeah, it's nothing on the women that has, please. And, and I, I do want to clarify that. It's that the world is unfair. We should not have a world in which children, and especially in this country that we live in, it's not acceptable. And in any way that that judgment goes on to mothers, is unacceptable. The weight that they are carrying, the responsibility, like I just said, I could barely take care of myself and survival, basic survival is an everyday thing. And, I, and then you got it. I thank Creator every day my kids were taken care of. So I applaud any woman who, and so when I ask that question, please, it's never against anyone who has to take them in the system. It's that it's an unfair world. That Ooh, there is so I, get, I understand, I, I, I get it. Um, yeah, I, well, yeah. I was going to speak again because I see uh, poli politics and belief systems directly involved. And uh, um, the best way I'm trying, I'm trying to, the best way I can describe what it was like to have a baby and know you didn't have a place to live or it was so precarious that you were terrified because you were terrified of the children's aid. You were terrified of the dangers around you. And um, I can remember being up late at night, Mariah not being able to sleep because I was so stressed and just rocking her in my arms and just praying. And I mean praying. And I've never prayed so fucking hard in my life that we would survive. So, uh, and it was at the time, this is what I want to say, it was when they decided that women with children were no longer gonna be on the emergency list. So we couldn't even, because it wasn't fair, you know, because of the drink and the beer. And um, so there was no way to get on the list. So I had to live in circumstances that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And I was terrified because all I wanted to do was keep my child. I was so scared to have this child on my own that I almost gave her up for adoption. I went, I had a midwife, I was very lucky. It was at the time when midwives were kind of like fighting to be legal. Anyway, so I had this awesome midwife and uh, 
because I went in and I said, women like me aren't supposed to have babies. So uh, why don't you just, we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen now. And then she could go with somebody who can look after her because that's the story, right? And so uh, it was my midwife actually who said, you know, you're, able, you're gonna do this and I know you're gonna do it. And she was right because there was no way. There was no way I was gonna give up my child and certainly not to this state. No way, no way. All right, that's what I have to say. <laughs> when, it, when, it, when it came to David, um, I feel like I fought and I fought. And I mean, most of you guys know my whole story about my son, but I fought and I fought and I fought, but I didn't have support. Like I didn't know, like both my parents have passed away. I'm not for me, that's not gonna be maybe just explaining some stuff. Um, and I didn't have anybody to turn to then. Like I didn't have family or anything, so I didn't know what to do. Um, and I couldn't fight it anymore by myself. And I feel like I've never given up on my son, and I will never, ever give up on him. And for those that know me, like Alex and Heather, and they'll, they'll probably agree with me there. They know me well enough, I hope. Um, but... The system, the system just tears you down further than anything can. I think the system actually will hurt somebody more than drugs will. If, if you look at it, like I, I was, I mean, I was addicted to a lot of stuff when I was younger and I, I'm a person that has been clean, for, I've been clean for 15 years with three slips. But I, I tell you that the family and children services tore me apart worse than drugs ever did. Yep. A lot about the systems can be informed and uh, a lot can be learned and applied as even Jeff Wilmer reminded us that what we're sharing here today is not easy, it's brave and it's vulnerable and it's strong because of that. And no matter um, how society or the systems label us, um, I will always remember how I was blaming myself not being able to provide for my child and nothing anybody else would think would come close to the level of um, shame and guilt for no good reason, right? But you just cannot help it. You're looking at your kid and wow, this is why we came. This is our destiny. Um, why did I bring my child across the ocean, right? Um, so, you know, sometimes you go from bad to worse to bad to good. And over here today sharing, that's, uh, that's, that's a huge success for all of us. Thank you. Um, anybody else wants to comment before we go to um, another special contributor? Nadine, anything you wanted to share on this question from the attendees? No? Um, William asked a question that popped up on my screen. Well, it's uh, Georgina's following uh, some of the questions in order, but we will go now to Debbie Chapman first and then go back to Georgina with the questions from attendees. Debbie, thank you for raising your hand. Yeah, well, thank you for, for inviting me. Um, and I, I wanna start by saying um, that this is really powerful. And I wanna thank everybody for, for um, you know, telling us your stories and, and um, it's, it's a great space, I think, to, and it's, it seems to me like a safe space to, for these things to come out. Um, as we look around the city, we see cranes everywhere. Um, but as has been pointed out, we have a housing crisis. Um, and we know we have increasing numbers of homeless people and precar precariously housed people. And, um, you know, we're, we're, all levels of government, I think, I would say, have a responsibility in, in solving this problem. Um, what I, what, I guess what I want to ask is, what spaces would you like to see opened so that these stories can be heard, and not just heard, but taken into account as um, decisions are being made? And, and that, like I said, I, I do believe that all levels of government have a responsibility in, in solving this housing crisis. And, and to think that in a country as um, Kelly has already mentioned, as wealthy as ours, 
to think that this problem even exists is, is an embarrassment. So that's my question. Um, what spaces would you like to see opened so that you can not only be heard, but that your comments can be taken in, into consideration? Sure. Um, I think that some programs that we've had in the past have worked really well. And I think that if we brought a few of them back, you guys are all gonna laugh because you know I'm about to say step out. Um, Alex is laughing. Um, I think that the people that have lived through it already and are um, in a good place that we can help and pay back like what we've been helped with. Um, I think that we all have probably have a program or, or something that works for us. So if we all like put that all together into like a little group, I think that would work because I know that for a lot of the PAG members and I can speak for the PAG, um, we, we were all on a group called Step Home. And it was an organization ran out of the basement of marriage place, which is no longer there. And um, it helped. It really, really helped. And I think that was one of the big key moments in my life, having a step home worker. Um, she, she's, she's one of my heroes, and I don't have very many of those. Um, I, I thank her. She's probably like, I don't know, like she made it possible for me to be better, a better person, um, a better mom, a better friend. Like, I didn't know who I was when I met that woman. And I didn't know, I, I was so far gone emotionally when I met my worker. And that worker changed my life so much for the better. And that program and all the workers in that program, there was five, um, every member of PEG, had to be on step home or they couldn't be on PAG. It was like a, a, a group thing. I don't, I don't know how to explain that part properly, but um, it's been 10 years and that PAG has been running and we still talk about our workers from step home. And we've all been housed for like 10 years or plus, right? And our workers helped us get those first steps, like our first apartments and stuff. And we, like, we still talk about them. So 10 years later, you're still talking about a worker? They must have did something right. Because a lot of workers, yeah, they call them like an idiot, an asshole, a bitch, you know. But no, these workers were great. <laughs> so Heather's laughing because she knows what I mean. Um, so I think that we need to listen to more, more about comments like that, like comments about stuff that did work. And we need the funding. It can't, we have to stop doing a year pilot projects. We never know if it's going to be a hit or miss in a year. Like a relationship is a year and a half if you know you're going to marry that person or not, right? Right? We don't quit after a year with a relationship. So why are we going to quit a program that the government is paying in a year? They're all laughing. You know I'm right. <laughs> Seriously, that's my opinion. I'm so tired. Oh, man. <laughs> is your coffee? Grab your coffee. Alex, I just had coffee and an ice cap. So I've seen for um, a while uh, Nadine and Heather unmuting. Uh, would uh, one of you like to um, it share your like opinion? on the phone, so I'll take it until mm -hmm. she's ready because I want to really hear from her. Um, because first of all, I think that, well, okay, so I'm a nerd and whatever. So I believe that uh, we got to change the economic system and there's going to be some people who are very scared because they're going to think I'm talking like a communist. Um, but I'm actually trying to get people to see that we have been in a 30 to 40 year nightmare of really bad accounting. And that accounting has scapegoated every vulnerable population in this community. And what it's done is it's, it's made every organization reach for a bottom line. And it has stopped human. It, if, if, econ if an economy is not here for human beings, then I don't know who the hell it's here for. So, um, so I got a real problem with the privatization of everything public. And I got a real problem with profiting off of human misery. Um, that to me is what I think is happening a lot of the time. And people can think differently and that's okay. But honestly and truthfully, that's what I'm seeing moves towards and it's very disturbing. And also, I think it's important that we be brought into budgetary conversations, actually. 
Um, right now, it is so hard to even get information sometimes that you want and you want to understand it. You don't want to just get a number and then go, eh, because I get that like systems need a lot of money to survive and work well. And, um, but there's got to be questions about the way funds are being uh, allocated and what's a priority. And right now, all I see are a bunch of cranes. I don't see affordable housing. What I see is the migration of money. And that's all I'm seeing. And so that is really disturbing. However, there are all these little lights in the tunnel and they're mostly community based. And I know that there's allies throughout every office and every council and everything else. We just all need to talk more. Anybody who sees what's happening because we've got 10 years. That's what we've got. We have 10 years to lower carbon emissions and we have 10 years to make sure that there is uh, even a future for our children. And I know everybody here, whether you're single or not, or have been homeless or not, I know that you've got children. And how dare we leave this mess to them? For what, an extra, an extra boat in a yacht club? That's all I have to say on that. Thank you, and I'm sure both are receiving comments to what you're saying as well. And uh, uh, Diane Wales, uh, Shar is not here, but uh, she confirms, right? From she is CEO of um, Leadership Waterloo Region, and uh, three years minimum to uh, measure most of our projects. To what you said, Heather Brand to said says it's such an important point, not just listening to voices, but shifting power relations about who gets to decide what happens in cities. Nadine, would you be um, able to um, tell us yes. uh, what you think <laughs> now? Thanks. I think we should open a speaker's corners for homeless people so that they can have a place to speak, whether it's just like something like this. And, um, you know, cause they have a lot to say. And I thank God for Ron Doyle. Again, I have to mention his name because if it wasn't for Ron, I don't know what would have happened to me because I had no friends left, no resources. I had no money. My accounts were all frozen. I had, hang on. It's good we know, good we know our place. When life happens, we step back. Sorry. It's okay, Nadine. Yeah. So if it, <laughs> if it wasn't for Ron, I don't know what I, and helping 50 people here, and because of a better 10 city, the university dorm style apartment has 88 people or 100 people. And I, like, I just don't know what would have happened to these guys. And the winter was harsh. And I don't know, it, it would have just been so awful if it wasn't for Ron Doyle. I thank him so much and his legacy will continue. I will fight hard. And I just wanna say, you know, speaker's corner for some people to have a voice. Maybe have it downtown. Heather can take control of that. <laughs> I would say it needs to be more than a speaker's corner. A speaker's corner is cathartic. And what it does is we get our voices out but we don't get to actually, um, actually impact power and um, so I'm all for a speaker's corner, but I really, and I don't know how we're gonna do it, is get all those men that sit in those seats. Um, God love them all. And, but get them to actually sit down and listen and not do this when you speak, because they do this, they either do this. <laughs> or they're like this, it's, it's like, You know, and it's like, come on, just listen. It's not that hard. It really isn't. Maybe they do that. that. They don't know what to say. <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. Maybe they do that because they don't know what to say. They don't have the answers. Maybe they don't have the answers. Which totally leads us to the next session today, which is hilarious. But anyway, um, I think we got to get there. We, we still have 12 minutes, don't we? Kelly, please. Yeah. Um... 
just I, I wanted to because I think that question had started from from Debbie in, in if I was understanding it where where to share these lived experiences where where to make that impact and you know the first place I think of is those those you know decision makers those government officials those ones um, and then and then you know those experiences of, of they're not really interested well then I'm thinking well why aren't they interested and well you know it's the voters the voters are what's going to motivate them so how do we get this message to the voters to the people to re to get rid of that stigma that goes around that judgment that goes around to homeless people because there's the ones who have the power the people you know get so I love that idea of a speaker's corner get to know because it's anybody you know uh, pe there's people in this region who know me and were just beyond belief that you know the situation that came about you know so uh, it can be anybody right so we getting that stigma that judgment and then that's the push to those decision makers because they have to you know and if we are speaking the heart instead of those messages that there's not enough to go around there's a lot to go around. It's just not being dispersed in nice, fair ways. There's a lot to go around. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Thank and you, I want to add another thing. Sorry, Mom, before we go. I think Heather should run for mayor. <laughs> well, first, we yeah. Woman's first, mayor. There are some women who no. came before her. <laughs> we need a woman. I think it's too much about it's too, no, it's too much about the photo op. I'll have to operate somewhere inside the system. <laughs> this photo op. So, Heather. So, uh, Georgina, do hmm. we have a question from attendees? We do. One more we question do. here. We can um, go for another question, I think. And uh, thank you, Terry, for saying that the power needs to be placed back in the hands of the people who have lived and are living through any housing insecurity. It ties a big time our conversation. So Georgina, please. Yeah, I was gonna say, there's a lot of really great uh, comments here from the attendees. So all the panelists, I know you're, you're too busy to read them, but please, please read the kind words people are saying because they're really important as well. So let me ask this question here from William. Nadine mentioned a feeling of embarrassment that goes with being homeless. How have others felt this? And how does this feeling in a way sabotage people's ability to ask for and get help and support? Who would like to go first? Here. Yeah. I will. Oh, sure. Please, thank you. Um, at first it did. And then you just get to a point where you can't get any lower, so you don't care anymore. And you just start being who you are. And now it's like, whatever, like, if you need help, you need help, right? Um, but the first time you have to literally like walk into like a shelter, your all your pride is gone, right? And, and like, you just, you lose everything that first 10 seconds. It takes 10 seconds to take all of that away. And it takes 10 years to build all that back up, right? It does, really. It's a 10 second progress. It takes 10 seconds. Yeah, that's my, that's my, yeah. I think they should take pride out of, out of the dictionary. <laughs> take that word out. Such an what? awful word. What do you mean, Nadine? Pride, because pride does a lot of damage to you. Because you feel too proud, which I did when I became um, homeless at first, sorry. I was, you know, I did, I have friends that say, why didn't you ask me? Like you could have stayed at my house. I, I didn't know because of pride. I didn't want to ask. So I went to sleep in hallways because of my pride. Because you're trying to hold on to this pride. So that you take it out of the dictionary, take it away. Yeah, That's I, was gonna, I, think. I was gonna say one of the greatest gifts of, um, I didn't have much when I lost everything, but anyway, um, but there is a great gift in, uh, in not having a lot because you do have to learn, you do learn that it's not shameful to ask for help, but I will say that, yeah, that shame, that shame of not living up to whatever the standards are that are mostly in your head, 
they, they, they come from other places and those messages, but then they get internalized and they become even bigger. Because I don't think anybody's thinking nearly as much about you as you are. And, um, but it's that shame that it's like, you know, you tend to, you almost go down further because you're like, you don't want anybody to know. Like, I mean, I mean, I moved far away, like, you know, because I didn't want anybody to know. I want, I was going to, you know, I'll fix it somehow. So. And, you know, like for me, although I met Ron before I got evicted and he would ask me, is there anything I can do for you? Do you want anything? I would love to have asked him, can you help me find a place? But because of pride, I didn't. That's why when he came to me with his idea, I was like, oh my God. I was so happy because I wanted to ask him for help, but because of pride, I didn't ask him. And he kept saying, it was, do, you, do you need anything? Is there anything? And I was like, no, I'm good, I'm good. And because of pride, I didn't say, Ron, can you help me find a place? And he just did. So even when he came up with the idea, like, you know, when you go to somebody's house and you're hungry and you don't want to ask them, they're like, would you like some dinner? <laughs> and you're like, thank you. Because <laughs> you don't want to ask because you don't want to feel like pride. Can I, and, and they're like, would you like some dinner? That's why when I had the store, anytime anybody came in, I looked at their faces. I could always tell they want something. And I would go up and ask, can I offer you a drink? Can I offer you a chocolate milk? Can I offer you a chocolate bar? Because I know the, the look, because I've had that look, the pride. And I would just walk over to them. And, you know, um, like, I remember when I used to sell dinners, like jerk chicken dinners, and the lady would drop off all these meals and I was not making any money because I, I would see people and I would walk over, can I offer you a dinner? <laughs> and she would come for the money and I would say, Lucille, I'm sorry, I have no money. <laughs> and she would say, Nadine, what are you doing with all the meals? I'm like, I gave them away. <laughs> and she would say, okay, you don't owe me anything. But pride, you know, I would just walk up, can I offer you a dinner? I, like I didn't have it, but I did. I just gave away all the meals that I had to sell. That's why I'm not good for business. <laughs> I'm not good for business. Like, I mean, I'm not good to have a store because I wouldn't make any money. I would give everything away compassion too kind well you know though not everything has to make a profit that's, that's right. you know like i i get the whole exchange of money i like having a trade system it works for me but um because that way i don't have to trade directly with someone it's like if they've got a i don't know something i Apple don't want, computer right yeah if they got an apple computer that i don't want and um, I have a pair of shoes they can't wear. It's not a good match. So I don't mind having the trade, right? What I have a problem with is that there's just, not everything needs to make a profit. It can, it can, it can break even and be okay. And everything can be shared in that sense, right? Like it just doesn't have to make a profit because profit is about, profit's always about one or two people making more money than everybody else. And that's what's considered good business. And to me, that's just actually a thinly veiled pyramid scheme. Um, it's not necessarily an economy that's about love and care and making sure that our children grow up in 20 years and can function and can go out in the world and that they can help other people and that we can all survive together. Because I think that's what we're here to do. That and not, not try to like destroy the environment so much that, uh, that no one else can survive either. Anyway, my, my soapbox yeah. is done. I'm going to get myself ready for something else. <laughs> for something else, that something else is, um, is where we hope you will um, stay for the last um, hour and um, witness a very unusual uh, roundtable, right, Heather? We're going to have fun. But um, how we started this afternoon um, with, this, with Allison's uh, story, remembering joe and uh, stories of um, how we weather the storms solutions came from bottom up grassroots from the community and our peers there is a whole world outside of um, 
this um, economy that is uh, lifting all boats or the trickle down effect. And um, actually, we're in a context in the world, in Canada and in the region where it is. Money is moving right from one place somewhere in the clouds, right in this um, financial markets, and they have nothing to do with um, families, with human life or life of the rest of the nature we so much depend on. Um, and we have to think hard not to repeat what has been repeated for a very long time, right? That profit and, um, you know, uh, global economic systems would... Um, provide for us. There are so many other systems and other ways that we can renew our commitment to each other and uh, living in a healthier world. And uh, thank you all for listening. I see um, we are we have maybe a minute. Uh, Diane, did you want to give us a couple of words? And uh, you will actually close. So go ahead. Well, there we go. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for much, uh, so much for allowing me to be here today. It's such a privilege. And sharing your stories is doing a lot to help, help me understand a lot more about myself as well as our community. I did want to share before we break, just in case anybody's not able to come to the last hour, that on April the 6th, Leadership Waterloo Region is hosting an affordable housing cafe. We have more than 80 community participants already signed up. Um, Activa Homes has paid for the platform, so it's a free, it's a free event. We just want people to come out. Um, our class has been working hard on the last year on solutions for affordable housing. Many of you were there at the beginning to help them uh, they've met with many people in the community to get to where they are. So please come out. I'll put this right now into the chat, the registration. Uh, come out and be heard. Come out and meet people in our community who are passionate about affordable housing. We have government. We have um, builders, nonprofits, people with lived experience, people who just give a damn, you know. So please come out and uh, be heard. Thank you. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. There, can everybody see the link in the chat function there? Because that sounds like a really interesting event. Um, so thank you very much for everybody for that. I think we've been talking all day about how there's no single solution. There's also not a single story. Um, but it was wonderful to hear, too, about what points of connection there were about feelings and experiences. Um, so we're going to keep that going after the break as well. Um, but I wanted to introduce the next thing, which is going to be the video for the weary. So we're going to see that next. Thank you again, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Stick around. Stick around. It's a good video. Uh, <laughs> and and um, when you come back, we're, we're actually going to do a questioning session that's going to be lots of fun. We're going to end with fun, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Fun is good. See you soon. Have a half an hour. You know, go to the bathroom and stuff after you watch the video. <laughs>